You may think your hotel is already green, but are you green enough for today's eco-conscious traveler? Welcome to the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast, your destination to learn from hospitality professionals on the value and opportunities sustainability will bring to your organization. It will put more heads in beds and lower costs at the same time. We are your hosts and sustainable hospitality experts, Kathy McGuire and Amy Walls. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast, your destination for practical and profitable solutions to turn your organization into an environmentally conscious brand. I'm Amy Wald, your host, and this episode is sponsored by Green Lux, providing you sustainable hospitality and tourism solutions for your organization. And today, we are thrilled to have Jay DeVore with us, who is a real estate developer. He is um, by day, right? Mm -hmm. But your true passion project is a really great place located right here in Ohio, in Hawking Hills, called Idol Reserve. So we are so excited to hear about his forward thinking, the innovation that came together with him and his team uh, to start this. And we're gonna hear all about that so, Jay, thank you so much for joining oh, us today. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We can't wait to hear about all of the things Idol Reserve, what the future holds, and really the process that you went through. Um, you know, I think this is pretty innovative for this market. I love Ohio. I love Columbus. But let's face it, a lot of people thinking about taking on eco-tourism and sustainable hospitality projects are really in other places in the country. So, you know, let's first, I would love to hear about, as the CEO of Idol was Reserve, um, what was your journey? How did you get to be here today? Um, thanks for having me. I love the podcast. I've listened to all the episodes. Oh, um, nice. The guests have been great. I've learned a ton, and I'm honored to be here. We're so thankful to have you. Um, so number one fan, and then I can't wait to <laughs> you know, send this around to my network. And I love talking about the project. I could talk for hours. You'll have to trim. <laughs> yeah, you have to do that. We'll grab the hook. Start to like <laughs> pumping in some uh, sleepy gas or something. Anyways. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm Jay DeVore, and my background is in real estate and real estate development. I'm an architect. I got my license in Ohio in 2010, and then I got an MBA after that, wanting to learn more about the financial side of the business. I want to know who were the powers that be? How did Idle Reserve you know, come to life? Who, who were some of those um, major players? Well, um, What's unique about Auto Reserve versus some of the other projects that I get into is that this is a family project. So I'm partnered with my wife um, for obvious reasons. And <laughs> I, I, I mean that in both um, like a business perspective. She's my business partner. Sure. As well as my sister. And um, Your wife's not your sister. No, it's not my sister. <laughs> so it's um, your wife, your sister, and you. Yeah. Okay. And, and the story of how we got started is... Two, two things happened kind of is my wife and I used to go down to the Hocking Hills region of Ohio once a year, usually in the winter time, like around Valentine's Day or something. And we would pay stupid prices for very mediocre places to stay. Interesting. And the kind of like entrepreneur in me, probably after I got done with business school, I was like, oh, there's a business opportunity there for somebody to take it. And so, I, you know, we went down to Hockey Hills, and I love it. And I would go down there. It's, it's pretty close to where we live, so I could take an afternoon off work and take the dog down there and do all this stuff. And so it is a, a, a treasured place for me, but not the place where I live. And sometime shortly after having this realization and having visited there for a weekend trip with my wife, my sister Laura came to me, and she was looking at putting some money away. Um, so the way it worked out is um, my wife is she is the dean of design at a local arts college. Okay. And my sister and and she kind of her role in the project is the aesthetic. She's the chief design officer. 
officer. Okay. So the aesthetics, the messaging, the um, kind of the emotional, how someone feels when they go to the space, all of that is in my wife's scope of work. And my, my sister Laura, her scope of work kind of fell into more operational stuff. Okay. And my scope of work kind of became the, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but like the development part of, we have nothing, how do we take that from having some buildings? Like that's what I knew to do. Gotcha. Was build buildings, get them financed, do the contracts, all that stuff. So in some ways it's been great. It has, we have had fair share of arguments and you know, <laughs> slam doors and stuff like that. But um, it's been really fun having the opportunity to work with my sister. Oh, I'm like, sure. Honestly, it was that's been the most satisfying part of this was spending some time. Oh together. yeah. So it sounds like this was, as you explained it earlier, the perfect triage. Um, you've got three experts bringing together their knowledge. It's a passion project, yeah. and it's a profitable business. So, man, sounds like a win-win. I, let's get into um, so some insights. I think when we're talking to hospitality and tourism um, organizations and they think about either retrofitting, new builds, um, or taking on any kind of these initiatives, first thought is, man, this is gonna cost me so much money, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So as your beginning you know, ideations came and you started having charrettes with people, um, talk to us about what those costs looked like uh, and how they differed from a traditional project um, and then how you reconciled what those 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 costs would be and what your return would be and then j again just some of the planning and the process and and um from a, from maybe some traditional projects you've been involved in um i'm so happy to you asked me this question so i love talking about the wonky financials and the amazing like magic that real estate has that um people wouldn't expect how the money flows and how it works and um the real estate uses leverage and all of these other things that aren't uh, typically associated with normal investments. So again, I could talk forever about the specifics, but on, on our project, um, we spent about $350 a square foot to build it. Okay. okay. And what we built for the, for audience members who haven't seen it or haven't had taken a moment to look it up yet is essentially uh, eco retreat that is comprised of cabins, eco cabins that are in the woods. So they're very much similar to a house. For all practical purposes, it is a house. Okay. Just you know, tightened up for vacation rentals. And in our area, a nice house might be built for about. Two hundred dollars a foot. Okay. So we are not quite twice what a normal construction cost would be. Okay. And that meant that we had to be expecting some significant revenue yeah. in order to support those additional construction costs yeah. and development costs. And because of this, like you know, market opportunity that I perceived earlier and and because like you can pretty easily find a uh, you know ADRs and stuff you can understand oh yeah this is and, and tell the audience also. what the ADR is oh, um, average daily rate okay so it just what I was saying is like the the average daily rate in our community is about 300 bucks okay and the average occupancy is about 65 percent okay and that's based because of seasonal, maybe, that's, or? Uh, annual. Annual average occupancy is about 65%. Okay. And it peaks in the summer. Too. Okay. Okay. And um, I had a sense that if we built a really special product, we could do a fair bit better than average, especially when it came to occupancy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was modeling, you know, 80% occupancy. Um, and it was just a matter of like guessing and checking would 
would three hundred dollars a night at eighty percent occupancy cover the mortgage? Would it cover our investors, mm-hmm. you know, return on money mm-hmm. and pay the bills and all that stuff? And um, in some cases, we had to trim back a little bit here and there, but ultimately, it it made enough sense for me at the time, and I could convince um, investors that it was a good probability um, that people kind of signed off on it. There wasn't anything like this in the area, right. so it was a huge unknown. Yeah. It was and, a big risk. And, and see, for me, I, you know, of course, I'm a sustainability nut, but I'm not only grateful to you, but my hat goes off to you for being innovative enough to take on that risk in a market that that's not really what people have been thinking about up until to now. Yeah. But I think it makes a lot of sense to think about the willingness to pay for something that is not only quality, but has again, those alignments with those same values that that customer or that traveler is looking for that you are providing. You know what I really helped me accept this risk was I believed that our product isn't going to appeal to everybody. Mm-hmm. I knew that. Mm-hmm. It's it does not look like grandma's cabin. Sure. It looks and feels different. And I can't wait for the audience to see it because it is I haven't seen it firsthand. I'm I'm it's on my list, but it is spectacular. Sorry, I took you off oh, point. Yeah. But you were you were saying that um, Oh, here's what I wanted to say. It was like what helped me understand the risk or get over it, get comfortable with it. Sure is I could rationalize that our our product is not going to appeal to everybody. Mm-hmm. But the people who it did appeal to had no other options. They couldn't get this. So it was very deliberate, a differentiation mm-hmm. strategy. Like we wanted to go, if everybody else was going right, we wanted to go left. And I said to myself, well, even if this only appeals to like 10% of the people who visit this area, they have no other options. And 10% of the people that visit this area happen to be 600,000 people a year. So in 600,000 people a year might have a taste that is way off normal or like hospitality expectations are way different than what most people want, but they are not served by anybody else. And I thought that was really special uh, business opportunity and has driven a lot of the decisions that we made. So that drove the decisions for aesthetics, for sustainability, for the storytelling. Yeah. It's why it looks the way it does. Um, part of it is it's also what I like in what I'm proud of and what feels good, mm-hmm. but I could justify it to my investors and the sure. banks by saying like, there's nothing else like this in the area. Yeah, I mean, when you can lead with a competitive advantage, it's hard to argue with that, right? From yeah. from any kind of a, an investment. So, okay, so your investors were on board, didn't take much convincing. No. Did you get, Did you go out and do any kind of um, community feedback or did did you just solely base this on what you felt was going to be a winner and, you know, your gut? Did you seek any any community feedback? It was a gut decision. Okay. Um, I like that. We did look at data. I mean, as I mentioned previously, we looked at what rates were in the area. We knew what we had to achieve to like break even. We sure. knew what break even needed to be yeah. in terms of rates and um, occupancy. And we always, I guess, designed a project, and it is in such an area that's pretty unique. I, can't, I don't know how many other areas like this um, where this is applicable, but there was some fluff in the, what we thought we could achieve from occupancy, what we thought we could achieve from an ADR, that we felt like comfortable mm-hmm. taking more risks mm-hmm. and expressing ourselves more individually and 
course of money. Mm-hmm. Which I think that is what is so exciting about sustainability, especially when you talk about an independently owned organization that has full control over decisions that they make. Um, it really allows you to be unique, be creative, and express yourself through the project. And that's exactly what you've done with Idle Reserve. So let's, okay, so then let's talk about, let's get into really what are some of those sustainability initiatives that um, you have implemented, maybe you're thinking about implementing. What, what, what do those look like? What are some of those? Well, and, and how did I'm, you come to those? So I am, um, you know, I'm a developer. So the thing I think about more than anything are the sticks and the bricks of the property. Sure. And the operation side, I think we've done an amazing job. Uh, but it has less kind of like mind space for me. Mm-hmm. So what I can really speak to is what we did on the construction side, the technology stuff. Sure. Which would, I think, is earth-shatteringly cool and I'm super proud of. Unfortunately, a lot of it is clad with beautiful, you know, cladding and other stuff that you kind of don't get to see. Sure. The, uh, Textiles. Te- and, yeah. Right, yeah. But, so from a, a developer's perspective or from a sticks and bricks perspective, what makes these buildings unique is we started with a, um, what's called a metal insulated panel. So the okay. buildings... If you were to look at them, you would see that they look look very Scandinavian, wood clad, mm-hmm. modern, mm-hmm. set in this hilly, beautiful wooded region. What's underneath all that cladding is a structural system that does not look like anything most people have ever seen before. Yep. It is a 90, I don't know what the exact number is, but like 99% styrofoam. Okay. The walls are, you know, nine inches thick and the ceilings are 14 inches thick. Okay. And it's the same styrofoam that you would see on a white, like, throwaway cooler, Mm -hmm. sort of cooler kind Mm -hmm. of styrofoam, like the stuff that crumbles and breaks and stuff. And what they do to make it structural is they put a very thin layer of sheet metal laminated glued to the top and to the bottom. So this, imagine a big piece of styrofoam would have some flexibility sure. to it. until you laminate something that doesn't have any flexibility it's so it becomes so tough in tension wow. those things become like structural members they basically become like little tiny steel cables running through there and it makes it with just a little like one thirty second of an inch thick piece of sheet metal okay makes it strong enough you can stand and jump and whatever out. wow but the reason why you, someone would choose to use this mm-hmm. system is one is is basically the envelope becomes so stinking tight and efficient that it, the the amount of like resources you need to heat the building, cool the building, become a lot less. Yes, yeah. and there's probably very little leakage, right? Very little yeah. leakage. Yeah. The other thing that I find really cool is that these panels are made offsite in a factory. And, you know, a lot of times we like to use on-site, locally craftsman design stuff as much as possible. But when it comes to, like, building structures, what you want to do is increase precision and reduce waste. So if you can have something that goes together like a Lego, that is custom cut by lasers and water jets and built in a temperature-controlled environment you are not relying on some guy who's never done this before mm-hmm. to beat at it with a sledgehammer to get it to work. Like This is very precision, computer-controlled stuff that produces no waste. So no, there's no extra material that needs to be sent to the site. There's nothing that goes in a dumpster. Yeah, wow. Um, everything that is like, like factory-made scraps and stuff are recycled at the factory. So that you just get the exact thing you need to build with, which is really cool. Um, We kind of, on this, so the walls, the floor, the ceiling are all the same material. So, you know, to me, one of the things you mentioned was, um, 
you know, people not being able to see the excitement of that efficiency. But I think that is why the story is so incredibly important, right? And I think when, so when I started going on my journey and researching all these sustainability um, hotels and resorts across the world, that was the one missing link that I found. They were doing all these great things, but they weren't telling people about it. And you said that, you know, one, your wife's job, right, is she is the one that's storytelling. Talk to us about how important that has been, what you've seen feedback um, from guests, maybe that didn't know what was happening beforehand. They just saw it, thought it was beautiful or vice versa. Talk, Talk to us about that storytelling that happens. Well, there is a lot of like sustainability features on the operating side. Okay. So I think most guests hear that story gotcha. more than they hear the story about the walls made of styrofoam. Okay. So what we believe, well, I should say what I believe, is that part of my job is to be conspicuous in our sustainability. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like I'm a greasy marketer or <laughs> um, a greasy real estate developer when I say that out loud. But where that comes from is a place of education. And we want the community, customers, our guests to know this is a this is a um, a sponge made out of like coconut husk. And it looks different and it feels different. And we want you to know that because we want you to know that's out there and yeah. available. Yeah. And we also want to be recognized for the money that we're spending sure. to bring that coconut husk. Absolutely. <laughs> so there is a part of this that's telling stories about sustainability so that we can get some value out of it. Yeah. It's not, it is about us like wanting to do stuff that we feel good about, mm-hmm. but it's not a story about altruism. Right. It's not a story about us being a nonprofit. Yeah. This is about us a business. Trying, this is about us trying to find the Venn diagram intersection yeah. of what lights us up as as owners and people and managers and what the customers we think where they're going to find value and say, oh, that's cool and tell their friends about and yeah. stuff like that. So um, it is kind of a challenge to tell that story. And the way we've done that is on our website or marketing materials when somebody makes a reservation mm-hmm. with us, you know, in their welcome emails, okay. all that stuff, it's communicated as much as possible. Yeah. In some cases, it's been amazingly, like it's really landed with people. One of the, if not the first group of folks we had here was a group who rented the whole um, retreat out. It was a yoga group who was focused on women's health issues. And having, that was part of their story. Sure. And so they were attracted to us because of the alignments Mm -hmm. in their... I don't, I don't really want to put words into their mouth, but just the alignments of their brand values. Sure, of course. And being able to bring their customers to our place and have their yoga experience mm-hmm. and talk about organic mattresses and, you know, that stuff um, was really valuable. And they were the, our first customers and also our first repeating customers. Oh, wow. So... So... E- e- so you mentioned in those um, emails that you're welcoming the guests or you're giving them those tips on how to get into, you know, your facility. You're also, you know, educating them on what to look out for, how yeah. how things are made, what makes it sustainable, right? I think that's a really important. And I think the fact that you are now able to affect your supply chain is so incredibly important too. So it's twofold, and I talk about the business case all the time, but yes, you're a business, um, and it's your passion project, but it's got to be a win-win for everybody. So you're doing what's good for the planet, you're doing what's good for you as a person, but you're also doing what's good for your business's bottom line. Yeah, we have to. You have to, absolutely. We have to. Um, I, I wish I had more experience with this, but... 
honestly, like if if we were just relying on altruism alone, it would be a different story and it would be a lot there'd be a lot of friction, you know. Yeah. Um, and when you can say we're doing good and making money, the friction kind of melts away. Yeah. That, gosh, uh, that's a great point, Jay. And if if you're saying we're this is altruistic, we're doing this, but it's a nonprofit. You're relying on people's goodwill, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's a tough place to be as a business. No matter how good you feel, you have to still have investors. Yeah. You have to rely on their goodwill. Hey, we're yeah. going to take lower returns. Yeah. You have to have investors that say we're accept we're going to accept a ten percent return instead of a fifteen percent return because you're doing the right thing. Yeah. And that's not possible. Right. But it's hard. Yeah. It makes starting a business a lot harder yeah. if you're going to if investor pool instead of hundred people is two people. And that's true with your customers too. Like if you are relying on just the crunchy granola people, um, you Which we like, well, okay. right? We like crunchy I'm granola. I'm crunchy and granola. I'm crunchy and granola, but I also like that's, Paris. Those are my people. And I also like um, fancy places to stay. And those are my people. Yeah, those are my people but too. I, I don't, I would say like my concern about signing the loans and spending the money and relying on granola people only exclusively, I don't know if we could have started the project. Sure. I don't know that we would have gone over the fear and the friction of that. So the business case is what makes it possible mm-hmm. to do everything else. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it can't, I mean, you could look at it and, and get pessimistic or you could look at it and get optimistic and just, I guess how I try to think was like, this is a puzzle we gotta solve. And it means we can't chase we have to limit the opportunities we're chasing or going after as an entrepreneur and someone who does a lot of other development. We have to kind of like focus the opportunities we're chasing and um, and it kind of allows you to I apologize, I lost my train of thought. That's but, all right. Um, you know, you know what that makes me think a lot about is where the opportunity lies in the luxury space. Um, because I think for a long time and Personally, I felt a bit of a, like I was almost being a fraud. Here I am, I love nature, I love sustainability, I love animals, but I also have this other side to me. And when I first started my business, I knew that luxury accommodations were going to be a focus of mine because I think there's so much opportunity there to blend with sustainability. And I honestly believe that magic happens when you can combine those two the right way. You guys have obviously done that. And I think that that's what I'm hearing you say is that when you can offer a higher end product or find exceptional value in something, it's easier to partner sustainability with that. One of the toys, one of the the (laughs) stories that I tell myself I don't know if this is real or not, but part of the constructing and designing the buildings where we're trying to make the anti-house, okay? And the the anti-house. anti-house, okay. So, um, and, and I don't know if that's the exact kind of right sentiment. And not anti-house from a house perspective, but an anti-house from, I wanted something that was a clear difference than what people have at home. Mm-hmm. So I wanted something to be a sharp contrast to, uh, hey, I live in a community that's an hour and a half away and I'm, I have a middle class home, I live in the suburbs, I have whatever, that's my life. I wanna go to the woods, to the eco retreat, mm-hmm. to get my mind blown by all the cool stuff. And I mean, it's, it's kind of the hospitality story for me, which is, I wanted to, the sustainability is a big part of that, which is introducing sustainability into people's lives through this, like having it be part of the luxury experience. So 
and I'll, I'll give you an example. We have fancy sofas and furniture, and I, I and everything we have is way nicer than it is in my house. Okay. <laughs> And I'm sure my house, because I have six animals, so that's not going to last it's, ever. It's no contest. Like, in my house, I have the GE dishwasher. You know, in this, in our Anza house, we have the Fisher Raquel under cabinet, like, super fancy dishwashers yeah. that people are, like, have a lot of bling to them. Sure. And they're amazed by, and, and that's the story about sustainability, is they see that stuff sometimes for the first time. Sure. They understand it's like lovely and nice. Yeah. And it's not. And I think sometimes until you can experience it firsthand, the dots don't come together. Yeah. It doesn't all make sense. And then when you've witnessed a place, been in it, slept in it, used it like you would your home, you have this takeaway that I still don't even know how you would put into words, but it just all makes sense and it becomes yeah. much more. Um, you know, under, understanding. I, I don't know. I'm not. I, I think there's like little neurons in your brain that start to form connections that connect. This is amazing. Yeah. This is wonderful. Yeah. I want more of this in my life. Yes. That's a great way to put it. Okay. So let's talk about the future of Idle Reserve. Where you see, do you, first off, being the first, which is incredible. Do you see more more people um, moving into this space in in Hocking Hills? Um, yeah. You do. Um, I, absolutely, we do. So I can tell you that last year we were close to hundred percent occupied. Wow! That was our first year of opening. Wow! Congratulations! Um, in the whole region, there's some of this is like there's too much data to really or there's too much too many factors to fully understand what's regional versus specific to your property and all this stuff yeah but i can say kind of generally speaking that last year we were cutting edge um we were almost under occupancy this year there are several handfuls of competitors they're really good mm -hmm. and occupancy is definitely not we're not seeing the same um we're not seeing the same occupancy rates and we're not seeing we're not getting booked as far out in advanced someone you could look at general industry terms sure or you could look at what's happening in the economy and there's other stories that would help explain um what's happening sure what we're seeing but it's absolutely clear that other people other developers have seen this are doing something really cool on their own and um, we're not alone. And part of that, I feel a little bit sad about and part of it a little happy. Of, of course, know? of course. And I, I can completely relate to that, but we need more of it, right? We've got to, everybody has to start thinking along these lines, but I think that um, it's safe to say you guys are very unique and um, I don't know. I, I have a hard time believing that there'll be a lot of competitors for you. But so so let's talk about that. What does what does the future of Idle Reserve look like? I know you have five cabins now, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you're expanding into different markets. Is that right? We have been okay. looking. Okay. Um, we have been looking. We've bought property in Colorado in the mountains. Okay. And we have made offers on other properties in other kind of similar locations. Things we were looking at are um, national park areas, okay. other rural kind of like areas where um, we see a lot of a lot of um, rural type of visitors. So okay, there's certain lakes in um, Virginia, for example, that are big attractors of um, weekend travelers mm -hmm. and these types of like eco retreats don't exist yet and there's so we're looking at the things that we're looking at are obviously like visitors per year to the region and how many units are online and rates and all that stuff um, we have in the past three months or so as I mentioned our rates are our occupancy has softened 
and my wife and my sister and I have spent all our attention trying to solve that problem mm -hmm. versus expanding gotcha. to other areas. But we, the vision is, I think, if we're successful and this proves to be fruitful from an economic standpoint, is to roll these out, roll idle reserve retreats out all over the country. That is the intention, and that's how we have thought about scaling the design and the architecture and the guest experience too. Okay, so that's exciting. I can't wait to follow along. I have a feeling that's going to happen, but it seems to me you might want to. You're, you're being a little secretive, and that <laughs> is understandable. No, it's no, not. I'm just teasing. You. I don't mean to be secretive. I'm teasing no. you. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I can totally see this as a brand, and. Um, when we stop rolling, we're going to talk more about that. <laughs> but, all right, so for the sake of our our um, viewers and our listeners, we know they got to get to wherever they're going if they're in their car. But I, I have a couple of questions that I think would be really helpful for our um, audience. So as other developers are looking, without giving your, you know, your lock and key secrets away, what would you what would you advise if someone is thinking about a project similar ish to yours or a developer of any kind and they're thinking about sustainability? What is what is a piece of advice or some direction that you would give to them based on your past experience with this? I'm so happy you asked. The <laughs> biggest thing a developer, an architect, someone like that, an owner needs to do is integrate it in a way that it can't be what we call value engineered out. So there is going to be a time where you're looking at your budget and you're comparing it to projections of actual costs. So this budget you made a year ago and the costs are what the contractor is telling you it's going to cost and you're going to say we got a problem. Yeah. We got a big problem. Yeah. And if your sustainability is about um, a solar panel on the roof or a any kind of like thing that's an accessory, it's gonna get wiped out. It's gonna be like, okay, that solar panel costs seventeen thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Um, we can either choose between having the solar panel or not doing the project. Yeah. That's the real choice that I face with on most of my projects every day okay. is do we want to not do this? Do we care about sustainability enough or do we care about beauty enough or do we care about experience enough or community, whatever it is, do we care about it enough to not do this project anymore yeah. and walk away from all the work that we've put into it? Sure. And the only way that I know of to combat that is have it cooked in so deep that Nobody in their right mind can say, no. "Well, what if we, what if we scrapped it all, took yeah. that off?" Because that would mean we're starting for over from this project. Yeah. Um, or we're losing the integrity and the vision behind it. Right? It starts to turn into something else. I think that's such an important. You know, we always advise our clients and anybody I talk to to get sustainability embedded at the very beginning. You have to. Whether it's culture, whether it's a literal building, foundation, it makes the whole process more impactful, um, more beneficial. Another thing is, I mean, this is kind of what I see on my other projects, but along the same lines is we are often tempted by something like a lead. I'm assuming most folks know about lead rating system. Yes. Um, and what... I've had this conversation dozens of times in my life, which is lead is so expensive. What we're going to do is pretend like we're doing lead projects, but we're not going to file the paperwork and we're not going to go through the um, administration of it. And that's really tempting. And I wish I would have had the courage to call bullshit on that when I was younger in my career. Mm -hmm. What happens is that sounds good from a moving forward perspective but the reality is if there's no accountability there's no accountability so 
if 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 you got some other magic system to hold everybody on the team accountable, great. Yeah. But people don't. I never have. And what happens is like like we were talking about the solar panel example a month or a minute ago. Unless there's accountability, it becomes way too easy to someone to raise their hand and say, well, actually, what if we don't do that? Yeah, yeah. I'm so uh, glad you said that, Jay, because we do hear that all the time in the built environment. Even in op- you know when you can um, certify in operations, what happens, I think, is when you are willing to take on that additional cost, if you want to look at it as an additional cost, you set a standard for your organization, right? So not only are people being held accountable, but then there's a, an element of pride people have. They know they're associated with a certain certification or thing, and it just bleeds further into the culture. I'm, I'm such a believer in that. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. But it's hard to do. It is hard to do. You have and to really know yourself your, yep. and the people you work with. Yep. And you have to say, guys, let's be realistic. If we are saying we're going to do lead, but kind of like what we not would do. do it. <laughs> virtual lead is what yeah. we would call it. That means we're not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's no accountability. Yeah. And um, there's going to be a lot of other smart people who are doing things the old way and when you do things the old way that stuff just evaporates yeah you get left behind and I hate to say it like that but I do believe that we this isn't a trend this is a movement that's here to stay for so many reasons and people have to start thinking about it and get on board and you are ahead of the game well I don't know about that I do because I'm out there and I see what's out there and I really do believe, I mean, you said it yourself, um, you're cutting edge, and you are cutting edge, innovative, whatever terminology you want to use. And I am so thankful that you're here in the Central Ohio, Columbus region to be a pioneer and a leader. Lots of good things are coming to Ohio, and I think we have to have pillars that are leading the way and that can model those important you know, attributes and, and ways that we just have to start thinking about business and our buildings and the way we live and all that stuff. So one, anything else you want to make sure that we leave the audience with? I think you and I can probably sit here all oh, day sure. long. Um, but any, any last? Um, okay. What I want to leave the audience with is um, if anybody has any questions, reach out to my emails all over the place so okay. people can LinkedIn or find me um, don't be a stranger what I really want in this world is to help and inspire other people to do cool stuff and it's not going to happen if the old guys if the old white guys are fam- following the <laughs> secret family recipe of- if there's any old white guys watching we're sorry <laughs> Uh, but if you know, it's only going to happen if first generation entrepreneurs, developers, hospitality kind of like uh, operators, it's only going to happen if the first generation people are thinking about things in new ways, yeah. taking different risks, yeah. um, want different stuff in the community. If you're relying on grandpa to and if, if we are relying on grandpa to lead this path, it's going to be tough. And honestly, it's not their job, right? No. It they, they've innovated through their life yeah. in their time. And it's yeah. now their time to sit back and, and reap those rewards. So it's our job. I am, I'm feeling like what I said is like a little harsh and unfair. But what I really intend to say is I hope that I can make myself accessible. I hope that if there's anything that people have questions about that they feel comfortable asking, reaching out. And I hope there's somebody out there who's like, well, Jay is like medium hardworking and medium smart. And if he can figure it out, like maybe, maybe there's a chance for me, you know? I don't believe you're medium in anything. I just well, want to say, but. I appreciate that, but it's not, I don't feel like I have been touched by God on anything. 
everything. I just feel like I'm a normal guy who happened to get lucky and have good mentors and stuff, and that's all helpful. But I'm not, I'm not like uh, Richard Branson or something. It's just like <laughs> you are an Ohio. <laughs> I just mean I'm a regular guy. Yeah. And I and can if figure you can it out. do it, yes. It's, it's you just have to believe in something. You really have to believe I mean it's cliche as it is, belief is the engine, I think, to all you know, big yeah. possible dreams. Um, well, I am so thankful that you spent your morning here with us. Jay DeVore, real estate de developer extraordinaire, eco retreat. We are going to link Idle Reserve. Um, lots of good stuff in the show notes. Sure. You shared some incredible insights, which we're going to pepper in there as well to make sure people can take those nuggets away. So thank you again for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Remember, these are gonna be really practical solutions that you can take away, implement into your business. Um, so you're gonna to go to the sustainablehospitalitypodcast.com and sign up for that newsletter. And we're gonna keep you up to date on all of the hottest tips and trends and solutions for your sustainable organization that you're going to become. So anyway, have a great day. This is Amy Wald, your host, and we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us today on the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. And if you'd like a free consultation on becoming a much greener hotel, please visit us at sustainablehospitalitypodcast.com.